you know, it's really important to build a better, more comprehensive understanding of the relationship between people and digital technology. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast. This is the show where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. We've got some fun stories to share this week. Later in the show, we've got my interview with Max Kilger from UTSA, that's the University of Texas at San Antonio. He's going to talk about the six motivations of bad actors. But first, a quick word from our sponsors at Know Before. And now a word from our sponsor, Know Before. Consider, if you will, how interesting it would be to talk with a world-famous hacker, one of the originals, who cut his teeth on close-up magic and has now gone straight, teaching people to recognize hacks, scams, and misdirections before it hits their organization. Stick around, and in a few minutes, we'll tell you how you can. And we are back. Joe, you know, we record these shows a few days before they actually are published, but this show is scheduled to be published on Valentine's Day. It is. So we thought we would focus on uh, Valentine's Day uh, sort of romance scams and so forth. I have to say, you certainly went all out this morning decorating the studio here. It's full of beautiful red roses and boxes of chocolates. And not only that, but Joe is wearing a candy apple red tuxedo today. Yes, I am. Celebration of Valentine's Day, looking very dapper there. I don't know where one gets a, a tuxedo like that, but not everyone can pull it off, but on you, somehow it works. I had it tailor-made, Dave. That's very nice. Yes. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Well, why don't we jump in with our stories here. Joe, what do you have for us? So I have this article from the Better Business Bureau that actually talks about the anatomy of a romance scam and mm. how these things work. And they generally have some very common features. And the BBB has broken them down to four phases of attack. Okay. And the first phase is contacting the victims. Sure. Of course. They got to reach out at first. They'll create some kind of fake profile. They could do it on social media like Facebook, Hmm. or they could do it on a dating site using a stolen credit card and actually set up what looks like a legitimate profile. But then they're going to quickly try to move you off of that platform of communication to try to communicate with you via email or texting. Uh, Why do you think that is? Maybe it's harder to trail them. I I suppose the actual dating site systems may have things in place to try to protect people, and so you want to get off that platform? That's part of it, that they want to get off the platform that actually looks for their activity. Also, the scam is going to become pretty evident when the charge gets challenged on a credit card, and then that site's going to get shut down, or that, that profile's going to get shut down. But if they've already moved you off to email or texting then they've already gotten you isolated from the platform. Right. Isolation is, is kind of a, a common theme that we're going to see here. Mm-hmm. The next step, or next phase rather, is grooming. They are going to learn everything they can about the victim's life. Mm-hmm. And this stage can go on for months. Some scammers will send small gifts. They'll send daily text messages or direct messages on Facebook or, or Twitter or something. The grooming also focuses on, once again, isolating the victims from their friends or family hmm. so that they don't have help when making decisions. In other words, they're going to make these decisions in a vacuum without talking to people. They're going to say hmm. things like, I don't think that your brother likes me. Oh. They're going to try to, or I don't think that friend has our best interest in heart. Uh huh. Right. They're going to say just things, keep this between the two of keep us. Keep this between the two of us. This is one of the red flags that you tell your kids, right? If somebody mm-hmm. ever says, "Let's let this be our little secret," then that's one of the first things to let you know that you should be talking to somebody about it. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. True. So anyway, this phase of grooming goes on for months, and then phase three is the sting. Right. This is where they cash in. Hmm. And the scammer will ask for money, usually on an emergency basis or a plane ticket to finally meet. If the victim sends money, the scammer will always find ways of asking for more money. Hmm. Right? They've struck oil, and they're going to pump this well until it's dry. Yeah. And the BBB was saying that there have been incidences where these scams have become dangerous and victims have unwillingly been pulled into money laundering operations, drug trafficking operations. And in a few cases, they've even been convinced to fly to foreign countries where they've been kidnapped and held for ransom. Wow. Which is terrible. Yeah. Absolutely just appalling. At some point in time, most people catch on and they realize it's a fraud or they wind up getting bilked out of all their money, which is a sad situation. But then the fraud will continue. And it continues in a way that we've we've talked about before. There will be some kind of follow-up scam, like the law enforcement scam. Hey, I can help you get your money back. 
if you send me some fees, I can I can chase this guy down and get some of your money back. That's just another scam. It's the what is it the sunk cost fallacy? Yeah. You know, maybe if I I can go after this, yeah. If I, if I can get my money back, no, you've lost the money. It's gone. Don't try to get it back. My dad used to say, "Throw in good money after bad." Exactly. That's a great way to say it. Yeah. Or. And this is insidious. The scammer may sometimes admit that the original relationship was a scam, but that they actually fell in love. Right? Really? Yes. They'll have the audacity to do that. And then the scam will continue as before. Wow. So the question is, how do you protect yourself? And actually, there's a really useful website that's from the Australian government called scamwatch.gov.au. They have an entire section dedicated to romance scams. And they, they say, obviously, if you can spot this early on, you're better off. Right. Yeah. So if you can spot a fake profile, that's your best defense. So look for these markers. Do a Google image search on the profile picture. And if it comes up as a bunch of different people or as a different person than the person you're looking at, you know that they just pulled that person's picture and put it onto a fake profile. Right. Right. <laughs> and we've seen that happen. We oh, had, yeah. We had the military officer who had his all of his images stolen and somebody was absolutely impersonating this guy. Yeah. Using his name and image. I, I'll tell you, my wife probably once a week. Gets a friend request on Facebook that is one of these scams. My wife gets them frequently, too. Yeah. It's a military guy yep. you know, or a guy in a military uniform, a handsome man in a uniform. Right. Yep. Once a week, she probably gets one. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. My wife, like your wife, probably just ignores them. Yeah. Right, and reports them. Yeah. Look for incorrect location information. You know, like if somebody says Baltimore, oh, right, mm, mm -hmm. something doesn't match up. It, it indicates that they're that they're just using city names and states and or they're in the wrong state. They want to meet with you despite the fact that they're maybe in Arizona and you're in Maryland. Someone who's not from the United States might not know that that's a very far away place. So it doesn't make any sense. Make sure the physical attributes match the description of the picture. They're going to have physical attributes in their description. And if it says they have blue eyes and you look at the picture and the person has brown eyes, that should set off a flag. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look for really broad uh, specifications about what this person is looking for. In other words, it, you know, I don't care anything about you. I just want to hook up. I just want to meet with you. That's another telltale sign. They're just casting a wide net, hmm. right? And, of course, broken English, if you see broken English. Right. <laughs> and then once you've already started communicating, watch for the warning signs like they try to quickly move you off another platform to communicate. We talk about that happens very early. And then there are inconsistencies in their story. Those, those, every one of those inconsistencies should be a red flag to you. Yeah. It's tough, Dave. It is. You know, you can protect yourself if you're vigilant. Well, you got to get the word out there, I think, to your yeah. friends and family and folks who might be susceptible to this sort of thing. Exactly. Vulnerable. Tell them to listen to this show. <laughs> That's right. So my story this week is actually an example of this. This comes from uh, the folks at AARP, mm -hmm. uh, who I would like to point out I am not quite yet old enough to be a member of, <laughs> but uh, boy, I'm heading that way. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Me too. <laughs> this is uh, AARP. They had a story about uh, a woman they, they called Amy. That's not her her real name. Amy found herself alone in her mid-50s. She'd mm -hmm. had a troubled marriage. She'd had an abusive husband who had died from cancer. And some time had passed after he died, and she decided it was time to put herself out there. So she signed up for Match.com, and uh, she had a pretty straightforward pitch. She said, looking for a life partner, successful, spiritually minded, intelligent, good sense of humor, enjoys dancing and traveling. No games. Hmm. So she, she went on a few dates. She met some people. Nothing really clicked, but then the system came back and informed her that it had a 100% match for her. Hmm. This was a handsome, fit, silver-haired man in his early 60s. He lived less than an hour away, and so she followed up, and this is when things started with Dwayne. Hmm. Never trust a guy named Dwayne. <laughs> We're going to really hit the Dwayne contingent of our <laughs> right. listeners there, Joe. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> so Dwayne wrote back. He had a long message describing his life, said he was a computer systems analyst from California. He grew up in England. So imagine the accent, Joe, uh -huh. the accent. He wrote her detailed romantic descriptions of how he imagined their first meeting. She actually did a little bit of digging. She found his LinkedIn profile. It was sparse, but it was there. Right. It seemed legit. So he's got a bigger footprint than just some rando. Right. He told her that he traveled a lot for work, that he was currently working in Malaysia. And one day, after exchanging notes with him for, for months, she came home and she found a beautiful bouquet of flowers and a note that said, my life will never be the same since I met you. Love, Dwayne. Hmm. And so she feels like she's falling for this guy. Right. Right. 
Well, soon enough, Dwayne starts asking her for money. Hmm. And he assured her that he was financially secure. He had a large trust fund in England, but he just needed a little bit of help getting some components out of customs for his job. He was having some issues with some bank accounts, and could she just wire him some money just to help out? He'd right. Pay, he'd pay her back as soon as he returned. Sure. And so she wired him $8,000. Wow. And, well, this is how it begins, right? Yes. So Dwayne strings her along. And That's he, a big first hit, though. Eight grand? Yeah. He strings her along, promises that they're going to meet, can't wait to meet her, but the requests for money keep going on, and excuse after excuse for delaying their inevitable face-to-face -face meeting. Right. So finally, Amy's sister-in-law, who's been kind of, you know, keeping track of all this and is concerned, she sent Amy a link to an episode of, of all things, The Dr. Phil Show. Huh. <laughs> and if those of you who may not be in the U.S., Dr. Phil is a TV psychologist, I guess, or I don't know counselor. what his doctorate's in. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably, I don't know, economics or something. Not, it's right. unrelated. But anyway, it's Dr. Phil. Uh, and people come on his show and he gives them advice on how to live a better life. And Dr. Phil had a couple of guests on his show and it was two women on the show who'd been scammed and their stories looked all too much like Amy's. Right. So at this point, Amy starts using reverse image search on Google, which you and I have talked about before. Yes. On the pictures that Dwayne had sent her. And sure enough, they were obviously a real person, but they were not Dwayne. It was someone else who, as we've spoken about before, was completely unaware that he was involved in this scam. Correct. At all. So over the next few weeks, she continued to unravel the scam. But in the end, she had been tricked out of more than $300,000. Oh, my God. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. She, she owned her home. You know, when her husband had passed away, she'd gotten some money and right. she owned her home. And, and this scammer knew that. And uh, in some of the early discussions, they'd talked about uh, their, their finances and so on. She contacted the FBI. She learned that there was very little that they could do to help mm -hmm. get the money back. Um, but one of the things that this article from AARP points out is that this is really a multifactored trauma that she went through. Obviously, there's the loss of the money. Right. But also there's the loss of the love. Right. And there's the feeling of being fooled. Yes. And the victims, they blame themselves, but quite often their friends and their family blame them as well. Right. Right. How could you be so stupid? Right. Is, is the thing that we hear. And we've said this time and time again, that this is not something that is an indicator of your intelligence. This woman is in a situation where her husband has passed away. Her marriage wasn't that great. Right. You know, so she's she's been conditioned all of her life for uh, or all of her marriage for for being set up for this kind of scam. Right. Almost. She's a prime target. She's a prime of the target. Exactly. Unfortunate circumstances she's she's experienced. I mean, she's got this guy who for the first time in, in a long time is somebody that's nice to her. Yeah. And it, unfortunately, it was a scammer who just absolutely abused that. Yeah. One of the things it said in this article, uh, I think it was one of the FBI agents who said, love is the most powerful drug there is. Yeah. And I, I think there's something to that. So, you know, we, we talk about you have to have empathy for these folks. But I think that's a part that's overlooked quite often is the part of the loss is you're not a fool for falling in love, right? I mean, the, you know, the, the heart wants what the heart wants. Yes. Right. Could she have been more careful? Sure. Sure. But the feeling for her was real. Right. And the, the loss and the suffering of that is real. So I guess one of the other lessons here is just be careful if, if folks – you know, fall victim to these things. Don't pile on. Yeah, don't jump on them. Try to help them. Yeah, you know, but they're try they're, to be a little more empathetic. They're going through a lot because there yeah. is something out there that will fool you. Trust me. Yeah, that's right. That's for sure. All right. Well, those are our stories, Joe. It's time to move on to our catch of the day. Joe, our catch of the day. This is actually something that I came across when I was searching around for some of the uh, romance scams, knowing that we were going to be doing a. Uh, an episode today, uh, thanks to uh, Valentine's Day. Yep. And this is a uh, an online profile that uh, someone had put in on one of these dating sites. And the profile goes like this. The profile name is, I Won't Murder You. <laughs> <laughs> My self-summary. I'm a fun-loving guy and a self-starter who has absolutely no interest in committing murder. I'm looking for love, companionship, or just that one lovely evening. And rest assured, that one lovely evening will absolutely end with you back at your house, safe and sound. Let me take you into my magical world of not murdering anyone, ever, for any reason. What I'm doing with my life? I'll tell you this right up front. Certainly not murdering anyone. <laughs> Least of all you. <laughs> right. Beyond that, mostly digging. 
Digging what? <laughs> I'm guessing uh, shallow holes in the ground. <laughs> right. <laughs> this sounds like something somebody who was going to murder me would say. You think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is diametrically opposed to our catch of the week from, from two weeks ago, or last week, rather, right. where the, the guy said he was going to murder you. Yeah. Yeah. This <laughs> right. is this is good. So, uh, obviously, somebody's having a little bit of fun here, but uh, <laughs> sort of the opposite of uh, what we were talking about earlier in the show. But be right. careful out there, folks. Uh you never know who you're going to meet. Yeah, online. if I was a woman, I would never respond to this guy. I wonder how many people he got responding to to his uh, to his not murdery <laughs> profile. Don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's funny. It's like all those people who who uh, get involved with folks in prisons. Right. You know, what do you? Th- what people want to save people? I guess. Or I guess. Help them out. So. All right. Well, that's our catch of the day. A a fun one this week. Uh, Coming up next, we've got my interview with Max Kilger. He is from the University of Texas at San Antonio. He's going to be talking about the six motivations of bad actors. But first, a word from our sponsors at Know Before. And now back to that message from our sponsor, Know Before. It can take a hacker to know a hacker. Many of the world's most reputable organizations rely on Kevin Mitnick, the world's most famous hacker and know before's chief hacking officer, to uncover their most dangerous security flaws. Wouldn't it be great if you had insight into the latest threats and could find out what would Kevin do? Well, now you can. Kevin and Perry Carpenter, know before's chief evangelist and strategy officer, will be running a webinar to give you an inside look into Kevin's mind. You'll learn more about the world of penetration testing and social engineering with first-hand experiences and some disconcerting discoveries. In their webinar, you'll see exclusive demos of the latest bad guy attack strategies, find out how these vulnerabilities may affect your organization, and learn what you can do to stop the bad guys. In other words, what would Kevin do? Go to knowbefore.com slash hackinghumans to register for the webinar. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com slash hackinghumans. And we thank Know Before for sponsoring our show. Joe, I recently had the opportunity to speak with Max Kilger. He is the Academic Director of Critical Technology Studies at UTSA. That's basically a program that prepares people for a career in the intelligence community. And he spoke to us about the six motivations of bad actors. Here's my conversation with Max Kilger. Well, let's dig into the list here. It's the six motivations of bad actors. Take us through, uh, what are we talking about? Sure. So there are six of them, and I'll list them off first. Money, ego, entrance to social group, cause, entertainment, and status. And a a good way to remember this is just to remember the word Mises. If you remember the old Hanna-Barbera cartoon with the mice Pixie right. and Dixie and Jinx the Cat was <laughs> right. chasing them, right, saying, right. I hate Mises to I pieces. I like Mises to pieces. Yes, That's, I remember exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And it's actually also a, a play off the old FBI counterintelligence term MICE, which stood for money, ideology, compromise, and ego, mm. which are the standard reasons why it was thought that people betray their country. I see. Well, let's dig into them one by one there. Take us through the list. Sure. So money is obviously the first one, the motivation for malicious online actors. And uh, that's the one that you see in the headlines all the time with financial assets and bank breaches, credit card breaches, and things like that. So that's a very major motivation for malicious online actors. It has been for some time and it will be for some time to come. The second one is Ego. And ego has been around a long time, since the early days of the hacking community, where basically this feeling of I've basically challenged and won the mach- over the machine. There are these technical obstacles, and I'm very clever, and I've overcome them. And so that's sort of the second motivation for individuals to basically exhibit online malicious behaviors. Kind of bragging rights, I suppose. Bragging rights, but it's also just this feeling of accomplishment. It's like, you know, I pitted myself against the machine and I won. Gotcha. All right, what's next? The next one is entrance to social group. So, of course, you have hacker groups and hacking communities, and you just can't walk up to them and say, hey, I'd like to join you guys. It doesn't really work like that. So, basically, you have to demonstrate some skill and expertise. So, you may write a particular exploit or 
piece of malware and show it to them and say, hey, look at this you know, piece of uh, malware or this exploit. And they go, oh, yeah, that is pretty cool. That's pretty clever. Oh, okay, you will take that exploit and you can join the group. Hmm. <laughs> right, right. So you get to be a member of uh, an exclusive club. That's correct, sir. Yeah. What's the next one? The next one, the fourth one, is cause. And that one is basically the one you think about it in terms of hacktivism and political causes, basically using the internet to promote a specific ideological, political, cultural, or social cause. Mm. And, and next? Entertainment. This is one that uh, in the early days of the hacking community was fairly popular. Hackers are, are fun-loving, prank-pulling, mischievous folks. And so in the old days, they, they loved doing that. And then this cause for malicious online actors kind of disappeared for a couple of decades. But in, in the last, say, five to seven years, it's come back because of a number of things, including sort of a large number number of naive users now on the internet. So there are lots of soft targets. There are a lot of different ways to basically uh, taunt and torment people. And so entertainment has kind of made a comeback. Hmm. And the last one? Then the last one is status. That is your status in your local hacking group and your regional hacking group nationally and internationally depends upon your skill and your expertise in a specific technical area like networking or information security or uh, operating system kernels or hardware and things like that. So status might be a motivation for malicious act just to say, oh, look, I was able to breach this firewall. I was able to defeat this security system on this phone. Things like that. Now, I suppose uh, these motivations don't have to be isolated from one another. Do you find that uh, certain ones tend to pair together more than others? Well, that's kind of interesting. Not as much as you think. Typically, people who have similar motivations uh, tend to group together. And uh, also, they tend to be sort of, oh, this is a primary motivation, whether it's money, whether it's entertainment, whether it's ego. They, they, they tend to be fairly primary. And you will we'll see some secondary motivations, so you'll see them paired a bit. But often, there's one that's very strong, and then there's sort of a secondary one that's much weaker. Now, I guess to that point, do you see uh, folks who are grouped together, is there a disdain for people who are motivated by other things? Yeah, that's correct. And actually, in the very old days in the hacker community, what happened was individuals who were interested in hacking for money, basically uh, stealing credit cards or things like that, were looked down upon by uh, the other members of the hacking community. That's actually kind of passed now, and now we have this huge cybercrime community. And so there are a large number of cybercrime groups. And so the old days are kind of gone. Now, for folks who are looking to protect themselves against these sort of things, and, and I'm, I'm thinking particularly when it comes to things like social engineering, I mean, how does your work inform those defenses? What, what kind of uh, advice do you have for people? It's the usual advice that you're going to hear sort of some other sources. You know, it's the usual stuff. Oh, don't open things from people you don't know. Whenever I, re for example, I receive a notification, say, from a bank or from a company that I deal, do business with, I'll never click on the email or click on the links. I'll always just go to the company's website and navigate to find whatever offer or whatever uh, piece of information or whatever action I have to do so that I never really try to react to anything that's either a URL in your email or an attachment that you have to open. So that's a pretty good piece of advice. And, and another one, of course, is to put some sort of defensive system on your machine, whether it's one of the local antivirus companies stuff, to use VPNs, uh, don't use public networks, the, the usual things like that. Although putting, say, antiviral and anti-malware software on your machine, it's good, but none of them are perfect. They're always going to let some things slip through. So just be aware. It's a kind of warm and fuzzy feeling, but don't get too cozy. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to me, I mean, for you, as someone uh, with uh, you know, deep knowledge of social psychology, you kind of sit at that intersection between the, the human side and the technical side. Yeah, I think that's really fascinating. That's 
what really started my passion many years ago, I sort of realized that how much it was going to change society and the way people interact and also the importance that it had to fields like uh, information security and cybersecurity. And I spent a number of the first years when I was doing this sort of wandering the halls of Washington, trying to say, hey, look, you should probably pay attention to this human element of cybersecurity. It's really important. It can help you sort of look into the future to see what emergent threats might be coming. It can help you sort of get out of your defensive huddle and become more competent and and confident that you can meet incoming threats. But I have to tell you, it was a very tough sell in the early days. And do you suppose that folks are starting to catch up and get the word? I mean, it seems certainly that with all the phishing attacks that we've seen lately, that the social engineering side of things has really come kind of front and center. Yeah, you're. At, that's actually a very good observation. And I'm actually happier because people are beginning to seriously consider some of the human elements and components in cybersecurity. And even in the cybersecurity field, there, you know, the, now you have threat hunters who basically go out and look for threats and profile them and try and track what they're doing. And so that's actually encouraging because you're really using the human components and profiling to basically help protect your organization. The thing I always tell people is, hey, look, you know, it's really important to build a better, more comprehensive understanding of the relationship between people and digital technology, because once you acquire that better understanding, you can begin to look out into the future and begin to say, oh, over here, that looks like that could be a potential emerging threat. And once you begin to do things like that and develop future scenarios, you can basically inform policymakers. You say, you say, hey, look, we think this might be coming from this direction and it looks pretty serious. And then policymakers can make the decision to put resources against that potential threat. And you're not always being placed in sort of a reactive position. Interesting stuff, huh, Joe? It is interesting. I give talks from time to time to groups of people Mm -hmm. in the community. Most recently, I gave a talk up at Hagerstown Community College to a group of small business people on cybersecurity. Mm. And we talk about why people hack. And I touched on all these different reasons. And I really like Max's Mises. Yeah, (laughs) it's easy to remember. Yeah, as as an old fan of cartoons, um, (laughs) You know, that sticks with me. But my point in these lectures is that we used to say all these different reasons, but now the biggest concern is the financially motivated hacker. The reason that is, is because while these other things, ego, entrance, cause, entertainment, status, are still factors in, in why people act this way, they make up a very small minority of why people do it. And those tend to be more random and less focused and crimes of opportunity. Money is such a motivator for these criminals that they have actually built out businesses around it. Right. And they have they have very efficient industry. It's it's an industry now yeah. to go ahead and exploit people and get their money. Right. Uh, it's not just the hobbyists. It's not just the hobbyists. Uh, it's their, not just uh, it, their kit computers in the garage. Yeah. It's like imagine, you know, years from now that uh, what you're looking at at Google now has some kind of, or, or Amazon or, or Apple, now has some kind of counterpart that's an illicit operation mm-hmm. that, that is as big as those operations. I, I don't think it'll ever get that big, but you know, you're looking at a late startup for these kind of businesses right. where, they're, where they're actually starting to make money and they're, they're being very profitable at it. Mm-hmm. I agree with Max's statement that the focus on the human element of security is a long time coming and that it's really good that we're finally just now starting to get, get onto it, but we really should have been getting onto it a lot earlier. Yeah. It's interesting. Why do you think that is? I think because we've all focused on the technology. Mm -hmm. And maybe the technology has actually gotten better. We've talked about this before. The technology has actually gotten good enough that the easier, the economic forces now push us to work on on humans. Right. But- you know, if we'd spent time anticipating this problem, and that, that's kind of the issue is we tend to be a little more reactionary than we should be. We should be trying to anticipate problems and get out in front of them before they happen. Yeah. But yeah. that's hard to do. Yeah. Especially on a global scale. Well, thanks to Max Kilger for joining us. And thanks to you for listening. That is our show this week. We want to thank our sponsors, Know Before, whose new school security awareness training will help you keep your people on their toes with security at the top of their mind. Do check out their webinar with hacker extraordinaire Kevin Mitnick. Go to knowbefore.com slash hacking humans and register for the webinar. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com slash hacking humans. And we thank Know Before 
104 for sponsoring our show. Thanks to the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more about them at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our coordinating producer is Jennifer Ivan. Our editor is John Petrick. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilby. I'm Dave Fittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. Thank you.